Hello there. Well, it's a very sad state of affairs when the European Union Parliament is more transparent and open in this debate than Westminster is. We are still unable to talk freely about the health emergency in the UK and on this social media platform without getting some cancel culture style pressure. But in the third conference about it in the EU Parliament a couple of weeks ago, two of the attendees, Canadian Dr Byron Bridle and US Dr Robert Malone, congratulated the MEPs for engaging fully with all concerns. Here's what Dr Bridle said. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, my name is Dr. Byron Bridal. I'm a viral immunologist at a university in Canada. And first, I just wanted to address the question that was just asked. So from a scientific perspective, what I can tell you is um, after this conference, from my experience of the past two years, inevitably, everybody who spoke yesterday will be accused of having disseminated misinformation. I wanted to point out that what I saw yesterday was an awful lot of primary data presented. Um, and when people are accusing us of disseminating Disseminating misinformation. They never address the primary data that we have presented, nor do they provide primary data to demonstrate that what we have said is incorrect. So in terms of the future when it comes to science, misinformation is something that we have to be very concerned about. Uh, and this, we need, the, we need the press to help scientists around the world and physicians around the world in this area because <laughs> If, if you aren't aware, there's talks in pretty much every country around the world about the potential to criminalize misinformation, fine scientists and physicians, fire scientists and physicians if they provide misinformation. This has to be of concern to the media because you have to start asking yourselves, if that's the case, who are going to be the arbiters of truth if it's not going to be scientists who provide primary data? So why can't we have some of that openness and transparency in the UK Parliament instead of watching MPs scurrying out of the chamber to avoid having to engage in debate with Andrew Bridgen while he quotes figures from primary sources? Especially when you consider that Dr Bridal went on to warn us that this same technology is being deployed into a lot more new procedures with many of them destined for use in our livestock, our food chain. And given the recent past, it would be extremely easy to imagine a proactive government legislating to make it illegal to put meat into the marketplace unless the animal had been so treated. And no one is able to debate it or refuse it either. While the manufacturers get full immunity... Would you blindly accept that, or would you want a full and open debate? Now on a completely different subject, the White House has picked a new leader for the National Institutes for Health, a Dr Monica Bertagnoli. But then someone started circulating a tweet which claims that she received over 116 grants from a big pharma company whose name begins with the letter P. And that was worth some $290 million and made up 89% of her research grants. Now, as far as I can tell, the figures are not disputed, but this has divided opinions. Some saying how awful that is, while others say, well, where did you expect the money to come from? I would just make two observations. The first is that 89% from just one company does sound somewhat lopsided. And secondly, wouldn't it be fair to say that Big Pharma only stumps up large amounts of DOSH if there is a potential for a large return on that investment? As Dr John Campbell pointed out a while ago, no one's doing a full vitamin D clinical trial because there'd be no profit to be made from it. And there are a lot of simple things out there that should maybe have full clinical trials on them to see if we can help bring medical costs down through prevention. Richard. British Prime Minister Rishi Sunak. Sorry, let, let me begin that again. Intensely unpopular man posing as the British Prime Minister. 
Rishi Sunak, who is the most powerful man in Britain, has... Actually, does it matter what he has done today? Whatever it is that he has done in the position of Prime Minister has been done without your approval and without your consent. I will leave you guessing what I was about to say about this man in terms of his latest actions on the world stage, doing the devil's work. We need to pause for a moment and reflect on who this man really is. If you want to know who the elected, the real elected prime minister of this country is, it is the uh, giant blonde child type chappy that the British people voted in. He wasn't much good either, was he? Let's face it. So we have a fake prime minister who runs a compromised government uh, of corrupt rich people, which as its main parliamentary opposition has a party of degenerate uh, liberal lefties who don't know what a woman is. And that is the context and yardstick by which you should measure today's UK political news. Oh, and you have Humza Yousaf, Rishi Sunak and Sadiq Khan. Humza Yousaf, Rishi Sunak and Sadiq Khan. Nah. Jeff. So Boris blew his stack then. But this one does show that he does have some consistency of thought because he was pointing out the errors of frogs. A couple of years ago, he said that Kermit the Frog was wrong to say that it's hard to be green. And now we hear that when he was PM, Boris wanted to go on an orgy of frog bashing. Doesn't he like frogs or something? Actually, Boris was being very rude to our French cousins after their president, Emmanuel Macron, after he accused the UK of not living up to its grand statements on helping those displaced by the war in Ukraine. Something that seemingly spawned a lot of ire and insults from Boris, such as calling Macron Putin's lickspittal and saying we need to go studs up on this one. This all came from the former number 10 comms man Gito Harry in a Telegraph podcast. But Boris himself, it seems, did not recognise that version of history. Richard. Speaking at some irrelevant think tank event, former Health Secretary Matt Hancock has urged unelected Prime Minister Rishi Sunak to end his culture wars strategy and, and support more liberal social values to appeal to people under 50. Is that people who are under 50 years of age or people whose IQ is under 50? I don't know. I mean, who is this man? Does he not know that when it comes to given advice, he, Matt Hancock, is a poisoned chalice? We are talking about Matt Hancock, who was health secretary when the arm intrusion came into being. You know, that lovely thing that's so good for us. The man who gave us draconian rules for everyone to follow that he then ignored himself and didn't follow and quite fragrantly, or flagrantly, I can't remember, fragrantly, flagrantly, broke the rules, apparently, allegedly. Oh, we don't know. We don't know about that, actually. No, he didn't break the rules at all, actually, thinking about it, did he? What did he? I don't know. And now Matt Hancock is effectively telling uh, Rishi Sunak to go woke. Mr. Hancock, in the next general election, you won't have a seat. You are about as popular as the bubonic plague and nobody trusts you. OK, that's unfair. Some people do trust you and some people do like you. I, I didn't really mean that. It's just one of those things that people say, isn't it? Uh, yes. Uh, I have a question, though, for you, the viewers. Why do we obey the laws, uh, the laws made by people like Matt Hancock and Rishi Sunak? I'm not suggesting that anybody should break the law, but I just want to know why we obey laws made by people who don't represent us. Please let me know in the comments section below and we will see you again tomorrow at 5.45, 5.45, And now we have Keir Starmer promising to renegotiate the Brexit deal when he gets his feet under the number 10 desk. He wants a closer trading position and to somehow fix the weaknesses in the deal, he says. Now, given our previous negotiations with Brussels, it's obvious they don't give an inch until they've taken a mile from a weak UK government. As an example, we get to sell sausage rolls into Northern Ireland, the EU gets to keep Northern Ireland. We get to take back control, they get to keep half our fish. 
Now the rejoiner brigade were given a rude awakening when the Labour leader said this was not about getting back into the single market or customs union or rejoining the EU. But Starmer is going to have to give something substantial away to get what he wants. But he hasn't quite grasped that yet. But it will dawn on him in time. Now, you've probably heard about the threat to our car industry because of some of the rules in the Brexit deal and that the UK government is on the case and wants to change those rules. Well, what you may not have heard is that those same rules will adversely affect the German car market and it's got them very worried. Worried to the extent that they are also wanting those rules looked at again. Something about them selling so many cars into such a lucrative market or something. Anyway, it's what Starmer might give away that should worry us. And he's already gearing up to give them access to our vote without any negotiating at all. So on his way to Japan, Rishi Sunak was asked by the press if he is sticking to the Tory pledge of reducing net migration down to the tens of thousands, to which he replied, I've inherited some numbers. I want to bring the numbers down. Could have fooled me. All I've seen is them ramping up to the point we're looking at another record this year, and then possibly another record next year too. Instead of asking if he's going to stick to the pledge, asking why he's breaking it every year.